Okay, so good morning everyone. Um, my background is, um, I'm an old nurse, uh, so I did the hospital training at the Alfred. Then I went to Sydney and did training at Crown Street Women's Hospital, which is no longer there. That was the midwifery training. I travelled for three years with a backpack overseas in which I worked in South Africa and London, both in plastic surgery. I came back to Australia and I did a one year plastic surgery training course at the Victorian Plastic Surgery Unit and then spent uh, 15 years there. And then from there, uh, did some renal dialysis work only for 18 months, then went back into a surgical side where I went with um, um, La Trobe University, sorry, Monash University and um, Wound Foundation of Australia for 14 years. And then from Monash University, I went to La Trobe University and set up World of Wounds. 2013, I gave that up and I just run my own consultancy business now. I spend most of my time Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in aged care. On Thursdays, I run a clinic in general practice and I've been running that clinic in general practice since 2006. Um, I'm a retired Colonel in the Army Reserve and I'm a volunteer with Interplast. So that's where I get some of my other training. So that's me, all right? So, uh, yes, ran clinic on Thursday uh, and, and love it. So I was just saying, I, I really do enjoy the, the clinic environment totally um, because you never know what's coming in the door. We have a very, very busy clinic. So I'm really pleased to see you all here because we do need more practice nurses to take up the speciality of wound management. It is a big part of your day-to-day -day role, isn't it? Okay, so what we're going to look at is the um, principles of wound management and they haven't changed for centuries, believe it or not. Um, acute versus chronic wound healing and then what everybody wants to know, which is what dressing do I put on it or how do I fix this? So the overarching principles of wound management, if you were to put any sign up in your wound clinic, it would be this one, all right, if you've got a wound clinic. So you need to understand how the wound commenced and what type of wound it may be and give it a name for its type. And the classic example we always say, a wound on the leg is not diagnosed as a leg ulcer. Yet doctors use it as a diagnosis, don't they? She's got a leg ulcer. Then we come back and say, yeah, but what kind of leg ulcer is it? What type of leg ulcer is it? So it's important to put a name to your wound. Then you look at the whole patient and decide what factors may be influencing healing in that person because that we're all different and one factor in one may not be relevant to another. So you have to do that individual assessment of your client. Then you select the appropriate dressing or device according to the type of tissue, the volume and type of exudate, the depth and the aim and there may be other factors that we also consider. Uh, so for example, in my aged environment, I'm considering is this wound even healable? Because if it's not healable, am I going to spend a lot of money on resources to try to fix something that I know is not healable? So we make that decision there. And then once healed, we revisit the etiology to ensure that all the prevention strategies have been addressed. So the example there is we diagnosed it as a venous leg ulcer, we healed it according to best practice, and we've got it healed. Did we cure the person of their venous hypertension? The answer is no. We maintained that person in a condition that allowed that ulcer to heal by using bandages and compression. So if you heal a venous leg ulcer and you don't continue compression of some sort, the ulcer will reoccur because they still have venous hypertension. All right? So that's sort of how that all gets together. All right? So tissue repair begins with the formation of a blood clot and moves through the stages of chemotaxis, migration of neutrophils, macrophages and fibroblasts, angiogenesis and the formation of provisional matrix, the synthesis of collagen, the assembly of a collagen matrix, the migration of proliferation of keratinocytes and finally wound closure. Now I purposefully put these words in for you. I could have made a very, very simple presentation, but the reason that I put these words in is because some of you might go on 
and consider making wound management a speciality, in which case you're going to read documents that contain all these words. So it is important that you sort of up it a bit when you're trying to understand the physiology of wound healing. So we start with, usually all wounds start with trauma, whether it be a planned trauma or an unplanned. So planned trauma is the surgeon putting his knife into you. That is, that is still trauma to tissue. And unplanned, of course, is a fall. So most wounds start in, with some form of trauma and all wounds commence with bleeding. So you should even consider that a bruise is a wound because those blood vessels were disrupted in some way and forced that, exu uh, that, that fluid to exude out through the blood vessel into the tissues. We then move into the inflammatory phase and that con consists of two parts. There's the inflammation, which is the body responding, and then the body starts to mop up the damage. So that's the destruction of dead tissue and cleaning. Once you've done that phase, you move into the growth of new tissue and then skin. And then over time, the whole area matures. So there's the sorts of um, uh, words that we're looking at. Now, the whole process takes about 365 days. But is it acceptable to have a wound for one year, non-healed until you get right round to the maturing stage? The answer is no. So what we want you to do is reach this stage in about a month. So if you've got a new wound and you haven't started to grow new tissue and you can't see skin starting, even if it's at the edges of your wound, you've probably either not got the correct diagnosis, not considered the factors in this person influencing healing or chose the wrong product. All right, so we need you to go back and reconsider. We give you four weeks to get that move into the, the, that phase. Then we go on and this is the maturing phase, which takes quite a long time. So the process of cleansing and removal of debris requires groups of cells to work together in consorts and under the control of growth factors and cytokines through cell signaling. Granulation tissue is then created from macrophages fibroblasts, capillary loops, inflammatory cells and endothelial cells in a loose extracellular matrix of collagen types 1 and types 3, fibrin, fibronectin and hyaluronic acid. I mention hyaluronic acid because in fact we are about to receive some dressings from overseas here, they're at TGA at the moment, that contain hyaluronic acid. We also we'll get fairly soon some dressings that contain collagen. So the hyaluronic acid and the collagen are helping to form the scaffolding for these cells to attach to. <coughs> so granulation tissue is a scaffold of all these cells. The wound matrix then begins to break down Amazingly enough, you put all this scaffolding there and then you start to break it down. Why would you do that? Well, because you don't need all those blood vessels that you grew to heal the wound. Once you have skin formed on your wound, there is this breakdown process going to occur. We break the collagen down because we don't want heaped up collagen. We want it nice and soft and supple and we, we start to change the blood vessel structure within the wound. So the way to remember this is to think about when you see someone with a fresh healed surgical site, the suture line is raised and red. You can run your finger along and it, it actually still feels like a, a rope is in there, yes? But you meet that person a year later, that suture line is pale, often even indented when you run your finger across it, soft and supple. So that's what's happening at this phase, this remodeling and maturation phase, is the body is changing everything. Consider that your skin is your largest organ, but how much oxygen does it require? Well, when it's intact, it doesn't require much oxygen. Currently, your brain and your stomach and your internal organs are demanding oxygen from you because you've had breakfast and they've got to chew it all up, right? But your skin, the largest organ, is surviving on 23% oxygen. Okay, so 
So when you break skin, suddenly those cells go, give me, give me, give me oxygen. So you grow new blood vessels to support that new growth. Now, when we talked about growth factors and, and cytokines, uh, the collagenases consist of three major matrix metalloproteases. That's what MMP stands for. There's MMP1, MMP2, and MMP3. MMP1 are the interstitial collagenases. MMP2 are the gelatinases, so creating that gelatine-like matrix that you can see when you mix gelatine together. And then the stromalysin is the MMP3. And if you have an imbalance in the, the one, two, and three, then you'll see the degradation of this tissue and it will complicate wound healing. So we want these things balanced. And what we find is that when we take a biopsy of a chronic wound, it is out of balance in its MMPs. So now we actually have MMP modulator dressings. So if you were to be very scientifically orientated, have a wound that's not healing, you biopsy it, you have a special tissue lab, look at it and say, oh, the MMPs are not balanced, you would look for your balancing dressing to put on and restructure it all. That's where that science is taking us. Sorry, what does that MMP stand for? Matrix metalloproteases. Now, there are actually more than 20 types of all of these. So when we go through, you can see with the collagenases, there's collagenase 1, 2, and 3, the stromalysins, there's 1 and 2, the gelatinases A and B, and a few others down here. On the cent central column, it tells you what cells make these MMP. So the keratinocytes certainly are responsible for the collagenases and the stromalysins. Uh, the dermal cells are responsible for some of the stromalysin and the gelatinases. And you can see on the far side the inflammatory cells and what they are manufacturing. So controlled degradation is necessary for, for healing. E excess MMP expression is detrimental to wound healing. And researchers have suggested that a possible treatment for impaired wound healing would involve a combination of protease inhibitors and anti-inflammatory agents followed by the application of growth factors. So when we have very complex wounds, we start to think about how are we going to get this wound back into balance? And from the scientific point of view, they would be looking at all of this. But we don't walk around with a microscope and look at our wounds and, and go, oh, there's too many eights and not enough fours in this wound, do we? So we have to learn as clinicians to look at tissue and try to work out what is going on with that tissue. So tissue assessment is vital. With regard to the inflammatory, uh, the growth factors, they're peptides that act on inflammatory cells, fibroblasts and endothelial cells to direct the processes. They are noted in the earliest period post-injury. Um, Platelet-derived growth factory factor and basic fibroblast growth factor are produced by the injured cells at the time of wounding. Subsequent activated platelet release of TGF-beta and PDGF to mediate the chemotaxis of neutrophils, monocytes and fibroblasts. So it is an amazing mechanism that you have in your body to clear this wound and to start to set some good grounding tissue down for healing. So as the hyaluronic acid containing provisional matrix is broken down, the decreasing hyaluronic acid and the concentration of the rising chondroitin sulfate levels increases fibroblast migration and proliferation. And the shift in these ratios of glycosaminoglycans uh, acts to inhibit fibroblast activity, inducing them to differentiate and thus initiate the maturation phase of healing. So it's a very timely well-structured system you have available to heal you. So with all that knowledge, you say, well, why can't we heal all wounds? And that's why you then start to look at that individual person. You start to look at, are there medications they're taking that could interfere with this? Uh, and are, what are those other factors? 
With regard to uh, the remodelling, the remodelling of the college and into a more organised structure occurs during this maturation phase and increases the wound's tensile strength. During the formation of the scar, the type 3 collagen in the granulation tissue is replaced by type 1 under the normal skin ratio of 4 to 1. With the remodelling process, a dynamic turnover of collagen occurs, but collagen synthesis equals collagen elysis. And this results in a tensile strength plateau of about 80% normal strength at two years. So in other words, once you have scar tissue, it is never 100% strong. It is an area that will be more vulnerable than the uninjured area. All right? So that's why some old ladies say, I only have to look at my legs now and I get an ulcer because they've had trauma on the same site over and over. So each time that will weaken that site. So it's something we have to include in our teaching. Please look after this tissue and keep looking after it. So that's just a slide to show you perhaps what some of the scientists are looking at with the various cells and the various factors, etc. It is complex without a doubt. So why does an acute wound become a chronic wound is what we have to ask ourselves given we know the science of healing. How did these things that you know, start as simple skin tears end up like this? Or the previous picture, a suture line that bursts open. Or another one, a suture line that's burst open. So researchers believe that the inflammatory phase of healing continues uncontrolled. So the normal processes that should continue, fail to engage, and so you get slow healing. And that slide goes through those various factors that I mentioned, talking about how perhaps they are out of balance. So you can see that there's no trigger of the acute tissue damage. So who would not recognise that they had a wound? Could it possibly be someone who is immunosuppressed? The answer is yes. All right, I don't have any cells in me to go. Oh my gosh, what happened? I need to send the army down there to fix that wound. So therefore the wound goes on, doesn't even kick into the first phase of healing. So I can't raise inflammation because I'm taking suppressants that suppress inflammation. Yeah? So that those could be in your population. Exaggerated inflammation. So somebody who actually has too much inflammation in their body, who would they be? all your rheumatoid arthritis patients, all your myalgia patients, almost anyone who's got an itis at the end of their diagnosis already has inflammation in their body. So when they get a wound, the wound goes, my gosh, and over inflames. And now we've got to try and get that balance of those cells back and it can't do it. Pain is known to delay healing, so we must address pain. And we don't do that very well and then going on to the other cells, etc. So there is this fantastic mnemonic out there for how do you start when you're going to do your full assessment of the patient. And it says Heidi there. So the H is for history, medical, surgical, pharmacological and social. The E is for the total body examination and the wound examination. The I is for investigations to be attended and stress reviewed because many times our GPs will take a swab but never look to see what the culture grew and the patient may be on the wrong antibiotic. May not happen so much in general practice but certainly does in an aged care setting. Um, diagnosis is then made following do, uh, doing all of those things and then we follow an accepted pathway. And of course, then once we've got that diagnosis, our intervention's planned and we make sure that we then uh, ex go back and reevaluate all of that. So the wound history we're interested in particularly is the initial uh, wound date. So how old is this wound? How much pain do they have? And what has been done to date? The medical and surgical history, we would be really interested particularly in what diseases they have. And is there a relationship between those diseases and delayed healing? And you've probably had quite an amount of education on diabetes and the science we have behind diabetes delaying wound healing. 
Diabetics don't make good macrophages, and yet macrophages were vital at the very beginning of this whole wound healing process. Um, but then there are other diseases as well. Um, if they're taking medications such as immunosuppressant drugs, steroids, and even some antibiotics are known to delay healing. But there's a whole gamut of other medications that we know delay healing, such as methotrexate, which many of your patients will be on. Um, and then obviously all your chemotherapy agents, etc. And from the surgical perspective, we're interested to know what surgery they've had. So if you're treating someone with a wound on their right foot, and you look at their left, which you should always remember, examine both sides of the body when you're doing your first initial examination, and you discover that there's a toe missing on the left, you would want to know why they lost their left toe. And if they found, you found out they had you know, a chronic wound there or ischemia, well, then that's certainly relevant to why this wound on the right leg is not healing. So have a look at their past surgery and see if there's any link between that particularly the deep vein thrombosis is linked obviously to venous disease. With regard to the medications, they're necessary for the treatment of co-committant disease, but they can have adverse effects on the ability of the body to heal. So this is out of an old text, but it's still quite current, and it lists some of the medications that actually are known to delay healing, many of which our patients take. The aspirins, for example, there are many of those. So if you're taking an aspirin or an anticoagulant, you'll delay your body making the blood clot. And the making of the blood clot is what then tells the body you have a wound. So right at that very early stage, you've delayed those neutrophils and leukocytes coming down to the wound. There are a stack of other histories and throughout this presentation, you have um, amazing resources that you can access. So the websites that you have in this doc document are all free websites. Only one of them actually asks you to register your name and email address um, so they can send you an update every three months on what's new on their website. So they're not invasive uh, people. So the top one is the European Wound Management Association and that creates position documents. Um, and the one I've got up here on the screen is the Hard to Heal Wounds, a holistic approach. But they have a lot of documents there, titled position documents. And then Wounds International, they do consensus documents or best practice documents. All of these documents, when you read them, will continue to support that whilst we don't have all the evidence for A, B and C, we believe a lot in clinical evidence. And so they gather a lot of experts from around the world together and come up with consensus on things. If I gave you an example, is there any evidence that salt baths help the healing of pyelonidal sinuses? Has anybody ever done a study of that? All right, well, the answer is no. Somebody did study that salt bath uh, thing and to get it to the stage where you needed it as an antimicrobial, which is why nurses thought they added the salt to the bath, you needed 20 kilos of salt to reach that level to be antimicrobial. So, you know, we do a lot of things without any evidence, all right? So when we come to those consensus documents about everybody saying, well, look, I know there's no evidence for this, but this is what I do, and it works. And then you find 10 other people in the room also do that. So apart from the wound histories uh, previously mentioned, we must not forget that we need to know about the wound itself. So how did it commence? When did it first appear? What's been done to date? How much pain? And has the patient ever had a slow to heal wound before? And if so, what was done? Because if the patient said two years ago they had a slow to heal wound and they were commenced on steroids or cortisone, that is a trigger for you to think this could be a very unusual wound. Pyoderma gangrenosum is one such wound. It could be a vasculitic wound. Both of those require corticosteroids. The presence of co-committant disease tends to lead to a slower healing and it influences the prevalence of other factors. So in rheumatoid arthritis patients, the frequency of leg ulceration is three times greater than the normal population. And in diabetic patients, the risk of infection is five times greater than in non-diabetics. 
So you're certainly going to be taking that very good medical history to help ensure that you start to target the right things. Um, the mental state evidence shows that patients' perception of their illness directly relates to how they progress. So it's about that interaction we have with the patient. We've all had patients who, she'll be right, mate, sort of attitude and they don't look after it as well as they should. Uh, and then we have those who totally focus on it and become obsessed with their wound and they don't do too well either. So we've got to try and get the patient into the right frame and get them to certainly understand their role in wound healing. Lifestyle factors are also to be considered. So smoking decreases peripheral blood flow by 50% for one hour after one cigarette. And excessive alcohol consumption is also linked to poor healing rates, but we don't know why. It is assumed that because they consume alcohol, then they're not consuming a healthy diet because that alcohol is filling them up, etc. So they're not getting that balanced diet. Um, but we don't ha have the full link of why that is associated. Um, although we do know that, you know, if you end up with cirrhosis of the liver, the liver produces some of those wonderful cells that we need for wound healing. So they may not be producing enough of those. So when we look at the wound itself, we're looking at the wound bed the surrounding skin known as the uh, peri wound and the peri wound is four centimeters from the wound edge all the way around that's the peri wound so you're you know whilst i want you to be responsible for all the skin around the wound you must have beautiful four centimeter margin all the way around so i'll show you some horrible photos after um, you want to uh, look at whether there is any edema what kind of exudate you have coming off and is there a smell? And then the normal other things that you would do in uh, your examination. We know that necrotic tissue, dry scabs and excess slough impairs healing and impairs the um, supply of nutrients to the wound and the migration of the epithelial cells. What we know is that the cells have to burrow under the scab, under the debris that's in the wound and that burying under takes longer than just walking across. Um, the foreign material in the wound will do the same. So we've all had, you know, cotton wool fibres or dog hair, cat hair, uh, grass cuttings. You've all had rubbish from the patient's behaviours outside of uh, your clinic and what you see in the wound. So you can imagine that the epithelial cells, which come from the peri wound, so wound healing starts out here. All these cells are in the tissue out here and they have to migrate in. So if they're coming in and they hit this crusty brick wall, they've got to burrow underneath and that takes longer. So we need to remove scabs. We, but we don't want to go so far down the track that we get this white soggy tissue at our perimeter because what's happening there is those cells are drowning so they can't even start to migrate across because they're being washed off all the time. So you get excess moisture, which then prevents in, uh, uh, predisposes the wound to infection, skin sensitivities and further irritation. And apart from wound exudate, of course, you've got to consider the environment you're in and you may have other forms of exudate. So in general practice, we have a lot of sweat, all right? But in an aged care facility, we may have urine and faecal incontinence. Prolonged exposure does lead to breakdown of skin. So we need to worry if it's on weight-bearing areas particularly. So wet, soggy feet, wet, soggy heels, the tissue's going to break down even more. With regard to infection, there's a gamut of documents out there and I would really recommend that you visit the websites where these documents are. There is no such thing as a sterile wound, but the greater the contamination, the greater the risk for infection. Infection disrupts fibroblast activity and results in a prolonged inflammatory phase. And we as clinicians need to differentiate the difference between colonisation, uh, local infection, um, systemic infection and inflammation. So the signs and symptoms are, of inflammation are redness, pain, heat, swelling and exudate. Nothing new to you. If you go to the woundinfectioninstitute.com website, you'll be able to download 
the 2016 position document on wound infection where they have clearly defined an acute wound, a chronic wound, contamination, colonisation, local infection, general infection, systemic infection. So the terminology is changing. Whereas if you are looking for infection, the classic signs of increasing redness and cellulitis, increasing pain, no diminishing of edema or heat, and a change in the volume and the type of exudate are things that we would all take into consideration. But there are more signs and symptoms of infection than just these. So the document will talk about pocketing in granulation tissue, friable granulation tissue, pain of unexplained nature, there are many other uh, diagnose, diagnostic aids to help us. So we will do a wound swab, possibly. However, the evidence for swabbing chronic wounds is not there. All right, so many times when you swab a chronic wound, you are wasting time. Tissue biopsies are better. And I'll come back to explain that in a moment. You would do an X-ray if this wound is over a bony prominence. So I have a couple in my clinic right now who have lateral malleoli wounds, all right? Tiny, weeny, little wound on the ankle. Frustrating because we're just so slow to heal. So, you know, we reach a point six weeks and we're not really seeing what we want to see. We'll do an X-ray. And what are we looking for? Osteomyelitis. And sure enough, probably one in five comes back with a confirmed osteomyelitis. Of course, once you get that suspicion of osteomyelitis, you'll go on and do a bone scan or an MRI or a CT scan. Sometimes we do sinograms or ultrasounds. So you may see a patient who has a dehist caesarean section wound. That's something we can see in general practice. And what I would strongly suggest you do there is that person um, usually has a small opening in the suture line but draining copious amounts of fluid. So if you get a sinogram or an ultrasound of that wound done, you'll find that there's a small track leading to a large cavity. So no dressings will ever fix this wound. So that's why we do sinograms or ultrasounds because we think we can only reach the opening, but we believe there is a cavity behind the opening. So we need to prove that, and that person would have to go back and have the whole wound laid open and then sewn up in layers again. And the thing you must remember is that if you sew someone up in layers, you should support the tissue. We want to actually squash that tissue together. We don't want to allow it to form some sort of a cavity. So we've lost the art of wearing girdles and firm bras and tubby grips and all those things. You need to consider putting all of these garments on people to keep those two edges together, both that way and that way. Um, how many of you have a handheld Doppler for ca calculating the ankle brachial pressure index? A few, you just got one. So I used to believe that every GP practice should have one of these, but it does take time to do an ankle brachial pressure index and time is precious in clinics. So many GPs will send the patient off for a, a duplex scan of their arteries and the calculation of the ABPI. And we'll cover that when we do leg ulcers as well. But if you have one, certainly you'd be wanting to use it. Um, and there's the scans that we could order. Now, if you've done all of that, you come up with a diagnosis. So for this dehist abdomen, the diagnosis was the person has presented with an abdominal surgical wound, pretty obvious, with delayed healing related to inability to manage bacterial overload and malnutrition. The patient was malnourished. So healing a wound in someone who is malnourished is very difficult because all those cells that you are expecting to come down to the wound need energy and they haven't got it. So once you've done that, you then plan your intervention. So we have the diagnosis, so our intervention is directly related to our diagnosis, which is a long diagnosis. So for this person, um, they need topical and systemic antimicrobials. 
we need to educate the patient about hygiene and support of their wound and we need to increase them on a high protein diet. So we've managed the bacterial load, we've managed their diet and we've educated them about supporting tissue. When considering the dressing, you must consider the tissue and its needs and naturally your aim. All right, so you've got your, your full understanding of wound healing, you've done your full assessment of your patient and now you're focusing only on the wound. So the tissue types that we describe in wound healing are necrotic eschar and necrotic slough. So they're both types of necrotic tissue and the difference between the words eschkar and slough, slough means it's wet, eschkar means it's dry. Okay. Granulation tissue and then hypergranulation tissue. So if you have hypergranulation tissue, you have this very jelly-like tissue in the wound. So we don't look at it and go, oh, it's lovely and red, oh, it's good tissue. We need to also assess the strength of that tissue. And we'll have a look at pictures of these in a moment. And then the epithelial tissue, top coat of new cells forming skin, and finally macerated tissue. So they're the terms that we use to describe the tissue types. And you'll note that they all also have a colour attached to them. So if we want to get down really lay, we'd talk about black and red and yellow and white types of tissue. But when we're speaking to professionals, it's better to talk about the actual medical term for that tissue. It's okay when the patients you say, I need to get rid of all that yellow stuff, right? So the black and the brown eschkar, it's possibly the unhealthiest of all colours. It can be soft and wet or hard and dry, and it can be superficial or deep. It generally requires debridement. So, you know, if you want to get rid of the black, you'd really probably aim to have a surgeon do it. However, there's a word of caution with black and ischemia. You wouldn't want to take the nice dry black scab dressing off if you have no blood supply to come down to heal the wound because the black is actually acting as its own dressing. So anyone who has a black dry wound and you're suspicious of ischemia, the rule is keep it dry. Now some of you may have been told to put a gel on it and that is wrong teaching now. So dry ischemia is kept dry. However, this one down here, you can see the body is wanting to break it away. It already has broken it away. And you can actually see some red tissue underneath. So the, sooner, the body's able to grow granulation tissue here and the sooner we get rid of this, the sooner it can continue to grow tissue. All right? When we come to the yellow, brown, necrotic tissue, it's made up of dead cells and debris and it can be creamy yellow through to a bright yellow, brown or grey yellow. The darker the colour, the drier the wound. So what you see here is a dark brown. So this is dry on the top but it's creamy yellow underneath and down here very creamy and you can see how much exudate's coming off the very creamy. So drier, wetter. If it is dry and you do need to remove it, you would think about rehydrating it. So getting some form of moisture on this one if you weren't going to cut it off. This one does not need more moisture added though. This one needs moisture management, something to soak all that fluid up instead of having it sit all wet here in the dressing and cause damage to the peri wound. There are other yellow tissues in the body though. So there's tendon, there's bone and there's necrotic fat. So you do have to be able to recognise what type of tissue you're dealing with and that comes with also knowing your anatomy. Healthy granulation tissue is really like beef steak. It's a beautiful, strong, lovely red, like this red here. Uh, it's not a plum coloured red, you know, purple red, because if you've got purple red, you've got venous congestion in your wound. You want this nice beef steak red. Um, and it's not friable and it doesn't smell. Uh, there's no pocketing or bridgeting. And we begin to see pale mauve creeping across this beautiful tissue. The pale mauve is the epithelial cells putting their feet out and going, oh, this is good, and they keep going. 
So when you get to the red, you're starting to focus on your wound edge. Poor quality granulation tissue though, like this, is lumpy bumpy all over the place. And it's very irregular. It has copious exudate usually, and there's nothing happening at the edges at all. So you'd have to ask yourself, why can't this person grow good granulation tissue? And for this lady, she was malnourished. When we did her bloods to have a look at her, her profiles, we found that her haemoglobin was eight uh, and her serum albumin was 22. They're very low markers. We need them at the peak of their, their markers for these types of uh, things. Hypergranulation is, um, bleeds easily, it's raised above the edges of the wound, it has loose bubbles of tissue within the wound, so you can see here, it's raised above the sides of the wound and it's flopping over onto this tissue here. Jelly-like appearance, flattens when pressed, so we do, if you see hypergranulation, we ask you to take a piece of gauze, press on it and have a conversation with the patient for a couple of minutes, take your fingers off and if it has flattened, then it is hypergranulation tissue. If it has not flattened when you've tried to press it and it feels fibrotic, it feels firm underneath, then it's probably a skin cancer you're looking at. So it's very good that you can differentiate between hypergranulation and a possible skin tumour. Uh, and what it requires is exudate control, direct pressure, and some antimicrobials. The most important thing on an area of hypergranulation is do not put another plastic dressing back on top. So, you know, don't put whatever you put on your wound and then cover it with an oxide or a film dressing of any sort. Or are you already using a foam dressing that's got a film backing? Because that just encourages more moisture underneath, which encourages the edema of the tissue. So we're wanting air to get to this and another example. Pink tissue is the wound in its final phases of healing. It's transparent when it begins. Um, so I try to teach in the clinic, when you've cleaned your wound, done your full cleaning and patted everything dry, have a look and if you see any matte finish colouring in there, that's the beginnings of epithelium. So a matte finish in a piece of red tissue indicates the skin cells are just there. And then you might see that person in a week and they're now pale mauve, those cells. We ask you to press on it if you want to um, with a cotton bud or you're at the edge of your forcep and you'll see it also wrinkles. So it's early um, skin growing on your red piece of tissue. But of course, because new skin is transparent, you only still see the red. So you need to know these other factors that will help you to diagnose that there is epithelium there. And this type of tissue requires hydration and protection, particularly against friction and shear. So there's the wrinkle test to show you the cotton bud pressing on it and you can see the wrinkles. And yet if we hadn't done that, you would say that's a granulating wound. The other tissues to be worried about are the greens, the browns and the smellies. So these will indicate that there is something going on and it's probably some form of an infection, whether it be just a local infection or a systemic infection. It generally then will require either antibiotic therapy or local topical antimicrobial therapy. Above all though, get rid of the necrotic tissue is the aim. That's the breeding ground for the bacteria. It's lunch, dinner and tea all in one scoop there for the bugs. And then one other factor that is considered is nutrition. So without a doubt, you have to have the conversation about healthy diet with your patients in order to heal this wound. And we know if we do a direct question with our patients, they tell us a lie. Yes, I eat well. So sometimes asking them to do a diary of what they eat for the next three days and bring it back and have a look at it, you may then see there are more carbohydrates there than there are proteins. And it's the protein we need to get into these people. This is just a visual for you to see um, what you and I require every day. So the white cylinders are what we require every day. And the coloured cylinders are what you need if you have a significant wound. 
So you, they jump right up. So you can't stay on the same diet if you have a significant wound. All that fluid that's leaking out into your dressings is protein. So you've got to replace that protein. Otherwise, over time, you will become hypoalbuminemic. So this just shows you some of the things that are required at the different phases or stages of healing. So in the inflammatory phase, you need a lot of energy and a lot of iron. In the proliferative phase, you need the energy, the, the protein, the zinc, the vitamin A and vitamin C. And in the maturation phase, you need energy, protein, zinc, vitamin A and vitamin C. Vitamin C needs to be continued in high doses for at least three months after the wound is healed. So keep eating the fresh fruit and vegetables because we want to build a strong wound. If you don't, the wound will become weak and then will break down more easily. Vitamin C is required for collagen synthesis. So there are supplements you can recommend that people take uh, for uh, boosting, and I know that Sustagen, it's not on the screen, but Sustagen has ads on TV now for the elderly. Just to keep you healthy, take a little more Sustagen, you know. So there are, there, our population are becoming aware of these supplements, and they may even ask you, should they take them? If you want more information on this, this is a free booklet. In fact, there's two booklets you can get. This one, Nutrition and Wound Healing, is for you, a health professional. But a couple of years ago now, I wrote another one for them called Support Wound Healing from the Inside Out, and that's for the patient. And these are free. So I gave away my last one in clinic on Thursday. Um, you can ring that number and ask for copies of these. Now, it is a Nestle product, I know. It's Nestle supported this, but it's completely generic. There is no pushing. I was one of the authors. There's no uh, pushing of a product in there, all right? Um, if you want to do a nutritional assessment, you don't have a dietitian uh, access, the mini nutritional assessment scale is available from that website. And that has been shown to be a very good predictor of someone who is at risk of malnutrition, equal to a one hour interview with a dietitian. So it's something all practice nurses can do is the MNA, mini nutritional assessment. Now, what changed the world was the study on wound healing produced in 1962 by Winter, George Winter, published in Nature. And he proved that, that um, epithelial cells in dry wounds have to negotiate the scab, consuming energy and time, whereas in moist wounds, they migrate freely across the moist vascular wound surface. So around 1962, we stopped painting wounds with dyes like gentian violet and mercurochrome and TB Co and all of those things were used. And they introduced moist wound healing. The thing was, he did it all on two pigs, all right? So he only wounded two pigs, many wounds on them and studied them. But he did find that in a moist environment that the cells moved faster. Now, animals have always licked their wounds. We don't ask practice nurses to lick the patient's wounds, but we know that if you create some sort of a moist interface, the cells will do their work. You are essentially cells, bugs and water as a human being, right? So your cells are bathed in moisture right now. So we're not encouraging the dry practices when we're aiming to heal. So you're trying to heal a wound, you need to think about the interface of your product with the tissue in the wound. So how do we do that? It's complex, all right? There are thousands of dressings out there and sadly there are more coming, okay? So it is an extremely complex situation to choose a dressing in your practice. But this is what I say, think about what your aim is. What is my aim? Is it to maintain the current moisture? So your wound is already moist. You don't want to suck anything off it, but you also don't want to add anything to it. It's already moist. Is it to donate more moisture? And you'll often donate moisture if the wound is particularly painful also. It's quite soothing to have a little bit more moisture there. Is it to manage the excess moisture? This thing is flooding. There's, there's water everywhere coming off this wound. 
whilst not completely sucking it dry? Or is it to aid autolytic debridement? So when you have a wound and your body sends all those cells down to heal, those cells start munching the dead tissue up. And of course, if you eat a lot, you excrete a lot. So the, act, the result of all those cells doing work is you've got stuff coming off your wound. So you need to catch it, all right, without sucking it off. In some cases though, you will want to add something to the wound to help that autolytic process, to encourage the cells to do more work. And then you have to bear in mind, if my cells, I'm now going to encourage those cells, encourage autolysis, I need to make sure I have a pad that catches that egg sudate. Right? Sometimes it's to provide antimicrobial properties. So think about what is the aim of this wound. And the aim is not to heal. Don't write down aim to heal. That's a given for 90% of wounds. Write down aim is two, and it's one of those. Because then you'll start to get a really good handle on your dressings, understanding your dressings and the properties of your dressings. In planning the treatment, you also have to consider the depth of the wound though. So what goes in must come out. So we no longer think about um, products that would break up. So some of you may have been trained to put a seaweed dressing, such as Caltasat or Sorbsan, a seaweed dressing into a cavity. Well, it breaks up and we don't know if we get it all out. So the rule is what goes in must come out. So that will help us choose our dressings and we want what goes in to stay in the same shape not to shrink down either so that's a consideration for us finally the exudate is important it's often described as nil minimal moderate and heavy but in the reality these are subjective because what's minimal exudate to you may be light to me so it's a very subjective area, exudate, because we don't put a bag on it and say, oh, there's five mils every 24 hours coming off this wound. We put a dressing on and it either comes back wet completely or it's not too bad. It's very subjective. The type of exudate also needs to be considered. So if my patients are taking dressings off, having a shower and coming to clinic with an old bandage wrapped around their leg, they have to bring their dressing in a plastic bag so I can have a look at it. So you have to look at the dressing you took off the wound and do an assessment of that also. One, did it manage the exudate or is it all completely saturated? What colour is this exudate? Because that'll give you, what, what's normally coming off is hemoceres. So if you've got any brown or some, some red brown, you've got bacteria. So you need to look at that. So a great document to access. It either can you can get it from your Convitec rep or from the Wounds International site, is this document, the Wound Exudate and the Role of Dressings, a consensus document. It's a brilliant document to read. It's quite old, hasn't been revised, um, but it's still really good and got great tables in there for you to have a look at you know, the volume. Why is there so much fluid coming off this wound? And then there's a problem solving table. Think about, has this person got renal failure, cardiac failure? If they've got cardiac failure and renal failure and they've got a wound, yes, they're going to leak. Um, I've already covered the, the explanation, all right? And finally, there is the peri wound, which we have never really given enough credence to before. So this is disgusting wound management. They've put a dressing on which has not managed the exudate at all. And this dressing is now sitting wet on good tissue and now causing excoriation of your good tissue. This is very poor management. So again, we've got to look at the peri wound and we want perfect peri wounds. I personally want perfect skin everywhere, just the wound looking at me. So we do a lot of massaging in our clinic of a patient's legs with moisturiser. We wash their legs and they love it. They go, oh, I could have that all day. Um, because we, we have to care for this too, not just this. We should be looking after this as well. So macerated overhydrated keratin is usually white. And then, of course, you can have these other descriptors for the peri wound. Is it inflamed, edematous, uh, or is there eczema or blisters, etc.? 
So there's still a lot of other factors that will influence our dressing choice, such as pain. We're not going to put a dressing on and have it stick. So we need, that person who is in pain has a painful wound, we need a dressing that will come off more easily and not cause further pain. Is there a smell? Smell must be treated first. So it's our first priority. If we have a stinky, smelly wound, we've got to get on top of the smell because no one likes to smell. Um, how much does it cost? So is your patient buying the dressings or are you selling the dressings to them? Are you charging a dressing fee? What is the size and shape? So there's um, the story I tell is about a baby, an eight-day-old baby I had to see with a strawberry nevi that had ulcerated on its buttocks. So every time that poor child had a wet nappy, that urine and feces was on this raw piece of tissue. The baby screamed. But the only dressing I had in my car was 10 by 10, which is the entire buttocks of an eight-day-old baby. So there's a company who used to make and do still do make a dressing the size of a postage stamp. And on Thursday, I met another company and now they've produced one the size of a postage stamp. Perfect, waterproof, wonderful dressing the size of a postage stamp. So, you know, size is important to us and shape. Where it's located, not so relevant in, a, in a general practice, but, you know, if you have a wound on the back of a young man who is now going to go and continue to dig the roads or work outside, he will sweat. So you not only have the wound exudate sitting under your dressing, you have sweat. So you need to think about what kind of wound will I put on this, the dressing will I put on this wound that is at risk of all these things. So location may be pertinent in some of the wounds. Uh, and pain I've already covered. So this is how we talk about our dressings. You probably talk differently, but you know we talk about impregnated meshes, but both plain and, and antimicrobial. So what is an um, impregnated mesh from somebody on the floor? Well, that would be an antimicrobial but a mesh has got holes in it. So the classic for all of you is Gelinet. Most people will say Gelinet. Now there are superior products to Gelinet out there. Gelinet causes maceration and leaves fibres behind and sticks. So there are superior meshes out there. And there are meshes, another good one, the antimicrobial for general practice is Inodine. So that's a mesh that contains low dose iodine. Very good, very good reasonably priced. But yes, you're right, there are also silver meshes out there. Super absorbent pads. For the efficacy of time, I will name some of these. Super absorbent pad is not combine. It is a product such as Zetuvit Plus. All right. The pads that are labelled super, super absorbent contain the same beads that are in a continence pad or that are in a child's nappy. So the fluid goes into these beads, the beads swell and hold the fluid in. So no matter how much pressure you put on top, it won't squit back out. Therefore, your peri wound is protected. Okay. Polyurethane film, you'll all say Opsite or Tegaderm. And polyurethane film wipes are things like Salice or No Sting Barrier Film or skin prep film. Um, polyurethane foam and foam-like products, there is a gamut of these products available. Absolutely a mountain. All right, so foams get us very confused, but the most common foam that you might say is Lyofoam, or Biotane, or Alevin, or Aquacel foam or foam light. So you all got a foam in your mind? Yep. Hydrocolloids, the most common you would say is Duoderm or Cumfeel. Other companies, if they have a hydrocolloid, will actually have the word hydrocol in their word. We don't use a lot of hydrocolloids in general practice anymore because it's a moisture retention dressing. Acrylic absorbent dressings, there is only one of those, and that's Tegaderm Acrylic Absorbent. 
Hydrogels, you probably all know things like Solocyte, Purulon gel, Solugel, Intracyte gel. Calcium alginates, Caltostat. Most people just know that one. Hydrofiber, Aqua cell. And silver products, all the silver products have AG attached to their name. So you can have Aquacell AG, you can have Biotane AG, you can have Comfeel AG. Hypertonic, a dressing that is hypertonic is me salt. And a dressing that is isotonic is hydrosorb. The, it used to be known as tender wet. We would not use that very much in general practice. It's a specific wet polymer pad used to aid debriding, used in acute wounds often or aged care to debride pressure injuries, etc. There are enzyme alginogels. So that is flaminal and flaminal fort. So the word says what it is. It's an enzyme. The two enzymes are lactose peridoxase and glucose oxidase. So these two enzymes kill bacteria. They are found in your saliva. And the algino part of it is that it is a seaweed turned into a gel. So that's how it gets its name. And then there's another product called uh, a microbial binding dressing, and that is known as Sorbact. There is only one of these in many varieties, but one brand name, microbial binding. We are soon to have on the market, as I suggested, collagenase dressings, hyaluronic acid dressings, and we are also having um, electrical charge dressings. There's another word for that, but I can't just think of it. So we're having dressings that actually alter the the electronics in a wound, the message signaling cells in wounds, called Zorflex. So there are a lot of others to add to this list as the science continues. So for you, you might stop and think, what have I got in my practice and now how do I reclassify them? Not by brand name, but by function. Because if you classify them by function, then it will meet your aim. So you can look at wound protection products, wound rehydration or wound din uh, or donation products, moisture retention, exudate management, debridement, antimicrobials, skin care or protectants, and cleansers and surfactants. We use a lot of surfactants now to clean wounds. So those surfactants are things like Pronto San, a cleansing solution. We also have octenolin and we have microdacin SOS. These are three cleansers that are known as surfactants that help to lift the debris off the wound. You pour them onto gauze, sit them on the wound, leave them for a few minutes, some are 10, some are one, and then you take the gauze off and the muck is already attached to the gauze. So surfactants, surface lifting tension uh, products. So, I would suggest that you begin with a matrix like this. You put all your aims across the top and you start to list either generically or by brand name your products. And then you see where it fits in. This way you're starting to get a much better handle on what you have in your practice and where it should be positioned correctly. Seem doable? Good way to start this one. Or you can list the type of tissue down the side, so not necessarily the aim. Just what tissue have you got in the wound and therefore what generic product or put your brand names across the top here and then say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. It's another way of looking at it. Or you could do both. If you did both, you'd even have a better handle on your products. All right. Um, and then there's another example uh, of the dressing and what its function is and what type of wound it would go on and how frequently it's suggested to be changed. So I have protocols in my practice 
So we have a picture of a wound and then we have a story how to look after it. So when I'm on leave, the doctors will continue to do the dressings the way they're meant to do them. So establishing protocols if you're a big practice is a very good idea. Doing these matrices is a very good idea. To get people to stop and think, you just don't go and pick up a product, the nearest one you can reach and put on a wound. You've actually given some thought as to the role of the dressing, the function and, and how it's going to cope with the exudate and what your aim is. Much better way of approaching wound management and much more structured. So when managing to uh, topically, uh, when critically colonised, you think about cleansing antiseptics such as betadine surgical scrub solution or betadine antiseptic or chlorhexidine. Your cadaxima iodine is iodosorb powder or ointment. All your silver agents have the word AG after them. Honey is still asked for by many patients. My best honey is the Beringa bioactive honey. Tea tree oil products. There's a product called Wound Aid Gel, which is a very pleasant tea tree oil smell. Uh, PHMB is the microdacin, but you can also get um, prontosan and octanolin. The hypertonic salt is me salt, and the antimicrobial binding product is sorbac. So all of those products kill bugs. And bugs are often our problem in a slow, chronic healing wound. So combine bugs management with good nutrition, you should start to see a difference in your wound. Now, we won't do this exercise, but I would encourage you to think about it, and that is pick your product, even if you have other people working with you, and say, well, where do we position product X in our practice? So how is it going to work for us, and when should we change it? What would we expect at the end? So when I put, for example, Flaminal on a wound, I'm putting it on because I want to kill bugs and I want to aid autolytic debridement. So I'm going to expect the wound when it comes back and I've cleaned it up to have less slough, but I do expect more exudate. All right, so think about products like and how you're going to position them in your practice. We're going to move on now to look at skin tears. All right. We might also look at osteomyelitis or talk about it. And with regard to skin tears, I'll just go back. There's a categorisation chart for skin tears, isn't there? It's known as the STAR tool. It's available either Googling STAR, Risk Skin Tear Assessment Tool, or go to Curtin University website or Silver Chain website. You should have this tool copied put in a plastic sleeve and held up on the wall so that the doctors understand and learn that there's a type 1 or category 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3 category skin tear, isn't there? So 1A is where the flap is brought back and the flap looks good. 1B is where the flap is brought back but the flap is dusky or dark. 2A is the flap is brought back, but there's a gap, but the flap looks good. 2B is flap, gap, but the flap's not looking good. And 3, there's no flap. It's a very easy tool to use, but it means then the person who did the first dressing on that skin tear and has documented well, when you come to do the next dressing, you know what to expect. So if it was a 1B, when you take it down in three days' time, you will still expect a dark flap. It hasn't just occurred. So you need to use the skin tear assessment tool so everyone's speaking the same language. It also does mean that you don't have to take dressings down to explain to the doctor what kind of a skin tear it was in many cases. You can dress it and then say, oh, it was a 2B. All right. With regard to osteomyelitis, so this lady, had, this is her anterior tibia, she has lymphedema, and when you put your forcep in those holes, you hit bone. So confirmed osteomyelitis just by probing to bone. So when you have holes, 
you need to stick your forcep in them. You need to find out what's at the bottom of the hole. All right. So this lady, you can see all the ooze coming out from her wound is not being managed well because it's burning her peri wound. So she needs antimicrobials probably, obviously, systemically and in the wound. And we need good protection of the tissue around the wound and good absorbency. So we've got about four aims here for this wound. So putting a silver dressing in those holes might be good, like Aquacel AG, zinc to the perimeter of all those wounds and a Zetuvit Plus on top, changed regularly with systemic antibiotics. A full thickness burn. We're not supposed to look after full thickness burns in uh, general practice. We're supposed to send a full thickness burn to an acute care facility where people, where there's a burns unit in theory. If it's a very small full thickness burn, we might say to the patient, look, you're supposed to go to hospital, but you know, there's an eight hour wait to be told, look, go and see your GP. Uh, so you might take it on, but a full thickness burn will leave a scar. So you have to let the patient know that, all right? This patient didn't want to go to hospital. It's full thickness, but it's Eshkar, isn't it? It's thick, tough, dead piece of leather skin. And we have to get this off. So we need to rehydrate it to make it go all stringy and gooey. And slowly it will all come off. So this needs some sort of a gel added to it. This particular patient would have probably had something like Flaminal Hydro for this wound. And it would have been dressed every second day. And the dressing on top would have been one that would manage that muck that's coming off it. No occlusion, nothing, no plastic on top of this to trap that moisture in though. The moisture vapour must come off. Oops, wrong one. All right, so this is an acute trauma injury and it actually has had some iodosorb powder used on it. So when you have iodosorb powder on a wound, you must clean it all off. Don't look at it and go, oh, that's dry, that's good. You must remove the old product, which forms this pseudo gel and it dries out. You've got to get rid of all that scab. So that's where a, a surfactant cleanser would help you. Or if you don't have one of those for this wound, you would put wet saline gauze on and go and have a cup of tea. Leave it for a while and come back and then start to scrape and get it all off. All right. You don't have pressure injuries in general practice in general. This is an unstageable pressure injury. If you are seeing pressure injuries, there is a category system for them. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. So one to four category system. And then unstageable and suspected deep tissue injury. So some of you not, might have known the one to four, but we've now moved into two other categories. All right, so unstageable and suspected deep tissue injury. And these wounds, uh, obviously you treat according to the tissue type that's in there and your aim, but also you've got to get the pressure off. So most of you won't see pressure injuries in your practice. This is a non-healing donor site. This is actually a four-year-old non-healing donor site. Totally unacceptable that someone waited that long to get help. Remember, you start to get help around the four to six week period. Um, so this is just locally colonized with bacteria. The boy is only very young, sweats a lot, head injury boy, other leg amputated uh, and skin taken from here to close the defect of the other leg wearing nylon -y jocks or undies, sweating and sitting on a non-medical sheepskin, sweating. So bacteria was the major problem here. Just by introducing a cleansing solution, antimicrobial, and some antimicrobial dressing on top and being changed regularly, he healed in three weeks. This one here, you will see uh, some evidence of other wounds. So you've got one up there. Uh, the foot is down here. Um, so you've got some other wounds. You've got signs that maybe some compression was on here. 
in an area and then you've got all this dry crusting edge etc so the skin needs looking after protecting and remove all this crust from here and get rid of this slimy surface that's on the wound so we would ask you to break your plastic forcep in half and start to give the wound a little bit of a scrape and this gelatinous type muck comes off and underneath you have beautiful healthy red granulation tissue. Your product that goes back on there needs to manage that, that tissue so it might be a foam, it might be an antimicrobial such as iodosorb or flaminal. You might put zinc right to the edge of the wound here so you don't get any crusting and you're looking after it and moisturise the rest of the skin and a pad. So here's another example of that yellow slimy surface on the wound and you can see here just with this curette it's like jelly it's it's, it's very um, gelatine like setting serum and it's often a result of the product you've had on top so the product on top has setting agents in it so duoderm's got gelatine in it for example and iodosorb has got sugar in it so these products have something that will attract water to it themselves and then it sits there like this matter. If you have a close look under there you see nice tissue. So all of that yellow has to be scraped off. All right. And then of course remember to care for the periwind. You can see this wound is quite wet so we really need to look after that and often we use a lot of zinc. Most common zinc product is pseudo cream. All right. Most easily available at pharmacy too. Um, this is another pressure injury, but the, pre the uh, principles would be the same. Anything that's loose and hanging, you need to remove like this. You need to get rid of all that slimy stuff there uh, by scraping. And if you are good with forceps and instruments, um, curettes, scalpels or very fine scissors, you can try and cut some of that stuff off. So good wound cleansing is required, not just anointing the wound with saline. You have to physically get in there and give it a clean. Right. So when you do that, you're going to then evaluate your dressing. And did it achieve the aim? Did it stay in place? Did it need changing before the scheduled time? Was it leaking? Did it create malodor? Did it hurt, causing more trauma on removal? These are all things that you have to consider to decide whether this wound, uh, whether this dressing has met your aim. So is it, was it the right choice? Did I do well? Is it heading in the direction that I want? It's what you'll be asking yourself with these things. So you should select dressings based on performance, not on cost. Not lock yourself into one company. So, you know, many companies will want to try to come to your practice and say, just use all our products, thank you. Not every company has the best product. So as a clinician, you want to be able to say, that's the best, that's the best, that's the best, and that's what I want. Ideal situation. All right. um, companies always report to companies the good and the bad about their products and always view new products, uh, if able, to decide whether you need to update your current list or not. You don't have to change if you're doing well. If your wound practices are all good, then you don't need a new product that's coming out. But if you are finding you're not managing Exudate, then of course you're interested in what products the companies have that manage Exudate. There are new products coming all the time. All right? So it's worth keeping up to date at least yearly on what is out there, particularly with these newer ones that are coming. The hyaluronic and the spray silver is going to come. That'll be amazing. So now we'll have a look at ulceration of lower legs because it's something that we see a lot of in general practice. You can go to the Wounds Australia website and download the documents. One sadly is 128 pages long, this one's 48 pages long. So the flow chart that's two pages is probably the best one for you to download. Easiest to follow. But I would recommend that you certainly look at these documents. So you need to get the etiology right. So back to what we started with earlier saying, uh, you know, how did it start? Ask if there's a family history of leg ulcers because venous leg ulcers run in families. 
You need to ask the pharmacist or the doctor to review the medications. Are there any medications this person's taking that are causing lower leg edema? You need to palpate the foot and leg pulses if able. Note the size, sight and characteristics of the ulceration and ask about what treatments they've had, what they've been doing to it. Because sadly, some patients put things on wounds that change the original characteristic of the wound. So I had some Laotian people put some green stuff on the wound. So when I saw it, it was green, I thought it was infected. But it wasn't, it was the green muck they were putting on it. All right, so you need to find out what the patient's been doing to the wound too, in case that's changing its original characteristics. You might need to perform some laboratory tests. So base bloodlines are always good to have. The one we're particularly looking at is the serum albumin level. But you also will be doing glucose to make sure they're not a diabetic. And you've already had the stats for new diabetic diagnosed every four minutes in Australia. You'll do an ESR or a CRP if you are worried about this being an inflammatory ulcer. If you have the ability to do an ankle brachial pressure index, you'll do it. Otherwise, you'll send them off for that and a duplex scan. And remember that if we are worried about what type of lesion this is, we might do a biopsy. And if we're going to the trouble to do a biopsy, get the doctor to do two. One for micropathology and one for histopathology. So one looking at the bugs and one looking at the cells. If you're going to hurt the patient taking a specimen, you might as well take two and do it all in one hit. The statistics are that 70% of ulcers on the lower legs are caused by venous problems. 10% are arterial, 10% are mixed venous arterial, 2% are skin cancers and 8% are very unusual ulcers. So the first thing to say is most of us see venous in general practice. If you're a specialised clinic like me, then I see some of the others as well. So this is what you need to learn, the characteristics of a venous leg ulcer. What does a venous leg ulcer look like? So I often recommend printing this slide off, redo it and print it off and hang it on the back of the female toilet door. So you're getting this in your head. These are the things you're looking for. So is there brawny edema? Does the leg begin to take on an inverted, inverted champagne bottle shape? Has the ulcer got irregular edges? Where is the ulcer located or where did it start? Medial or lateral, lower third, lower leg? Is the ulcer wet and shallow with minimal necrotic tissue? Is there a condition called atrophy blanche? And I'll show you a picture. Is there eczema and staining and does around the ulcer feel woody? That's lipodermatosclerosis. Can you feel a pulse? And does this person sleep well at night? And where do they sleep? Because these people go to bed versus the arterial, which don't. And we'll come to that in a moment. So there's evidence of venous hypertension. Varicose veins, spider nevae. There's the ulcer located in the medial or lateral aspect of the lower third of the lower leg. And there's your lipodermatosclerosis skin around it. Pigment changed skin that feels woody. The ulcer's relatively shallow. That one's got a little bit of an irregular shape, but this one over here is a bit more irregular. There's lipodermatosclerosis staining. And you can see the ulcer's starting down here in the lower third, lower leg. Here's the ulcer's irregular shape. There's the venous eczema and there's the ulceration with the venous in, uh, inverted champagne bottle legs again. There's atrophy blanche, which is white areas with little red reticulated dot-like patterns in them, often found around the ankle bone, the, the lower third of the lower leg or the, the um, top of the foot a little bit. Versus arterial. So arterial are located between the ankles and the toes, that's called the foot, high up on the leg or on the back of the leg. They are deep, they are punched out, and unless infected, they are dry. The skin takes on a thin, shiny, non-hair-bearing nature. They have thickened 
toenails, they have diminished or absent foot pulses. When you elevate the leg, it goes white, toes particularly, and when you put them down to the ground, there's a flush of red from the toes up, so that's positive Berger's test. They get infected rapidly, and these people have pain, especially at night, so they sleep in a Jason recliner with their legs hanging down, or if they are sleeping in bed, their leg is hanging over the side of the bed. These are the ones who have to get up and walk around to relieve the pain, etc. So classic arterial ulcers here. Deep, punched out, rotting toenails, dependent rubor, thin, shiny, non-hair bearing skin, over bony prominences containing necrotic tissue. More necrosis and over bony prominences. So classic. the next slides will come to it. If not, I'll come back. No? Okay. All right, I'll just go back. So what is a venous ulcer? It's got problems with veins. We're not really designed to stand or sit for long periods. So you have valves in veins and all the valves are holding fluid above them. If you stand for a long time, your veins give way, your valves give way and the fluid pools at the bottom of your leg. Over years and years of doing this, the valves become incompetent and now you have fluid in the bottom part of your leg which is not designed to carry a lot of fluid and doesn't stretch. So your thigh skin will stretch but down on the lower third of your lower leg, it's fixed skin. So it won't stretch so it pops and gives way. All right. So a past history of a deep vein thrombosis means that vein is now no longer working. So that valve isn't working. So that's why a history of that is there. Arterial disease is your heart pumping the red blood. There are no valves in arteries. It works by this pump up here. So if you've got cardiac failure and you knock your leg, you probably end up with an arterial ulcer because the heart can't get the red oxygenated blood down there. All right, so it's about understanding the venous system and the arterial system. A system we're not covering here is the lymphatic system. So lymphedema is a problem also. So that's why we don't allow people to say, she's got PVD, peripheral vascular disease. You need to stop people saying that and you know we are getting better at it. Don't say that, tell me what system is not working properly. Does she have venous disease? Does she have arterial disease? Does she have lymphatic disease? Or does she have a combination of? then you know which system to attack. So when you want to attack the arterial system, dressings won't work. Because there's not a dressing that takes red oxygenated blood to the wound. You need a vascular surgeon to reopen up that clogged up vessel and get that vessel going. All right? If there's no possibility of healing, if this person cannot have surgery, then you're in a situation where you may never heal this wound. So most of all, you have to stop the bugs from jumping in there because they're going to love it. There's no oxygen there. Yummy, yummy, lots of necrotic tissue. Whereas venous is only skin being washed away by the leaking fluid. So the treatment for venous is squeeze the leg and push the fluid out and keep the valves that are supposed to be like this, that are like this, back together again so that they function better. Obviously, we would want the person walking if possible, but if not walking, then elevation as much as possible. So the treatment for venous is, is compression therapy. And if you are practicing correctly with best practice, you should have a venous leg ulcer healed in 12 to 16 weeks. So that's the time you give yourself in clinic. If you hit the 12 week and your venous, your ulcer is not looking like it's healing, you better go back and revisit. Have you made the right diagnosis? And are you using enough compression? So the general advice, venous regularly walk, but not walk, not walk like this, shuffle, 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 but rather heel, toe, heel, toe, heel, toe. If you shuffle, 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 you don't use your calf muscle pump correctly. 
all right? So just like on the plane, you're going up and down, up and down with your feet, you want your patient to be doing up and down, up and down, pumping that calf muscle against the force of the bandages that you put on the top. Therefore, when the calf muscle contracts and expands and hits those bandages, it forces more blood back up through those valves. Elevate when they're not moving and wear the compression bandages and then eventually end up in stockings. And on the arterial, um, obviously not sit too close to heating appliances. They burn themselves. They've got very poor nerve supply as well. And, and um, they will need to sit with their legs down for pain relief. So getting them on the right analgesia is also very important if the vascular surgeon can't do anything to help. These are very, very painful. Remember, you've got to feel for pulses, so know where your pulses are. The top of the foot and the inside ankle bone area is where you want to be checking. And then what do you have to use as compression in your practice? Well, most of us only have tubi grip, all right? So know your tubi grip, know the, the sizing recommendations for the, from the companies, and know that one layer of any company's product gives about six millimetres of mercury pressure. So it's a leg warmer. To heal venous ulcers, we need now, we know, more than 40 millimetres of mercury pressure. But we're not going to put, you know, seven layers on the patient. Okay? So we have to know what we've got available to us. And the guidelines will help you. So what do we do in general practice? We use three layers of straight elasticated tubular bandage. First layer, toes to two fingers below the knee space. Second layer, toes to two thirds the lower leg. And third layer, toes to one third the lower leg, which means the ulcer will have three layers of tubi grip over it. The calf will have two and just below the knee will have one. That's called graduated compression. This is tolerated by most patients. If they get really frustrated, they can have permission to take one layer off before bed or even two, as long as they put them both on first thing in the morning. Otherwise, they can sleep in all three, as long as they're not a falls risk. They have to put their slippers on when they go to the toilet. There are elasticated bandages out there, but most of you may not have them. If you do, these deliver about 17 millimetres of mercury pressure. The lighter elasticated bandage is definitely tolerated more than this bl lovely blue line bandage. Remember the old blue lines that the doctors would say? Well, if that's put on correctly, it delivers 60 millimetres of mercury pressure. It's extremely painful. That's why they would roll it down, push it down, or cut it off as they used to. There are high stretch elastic bandages. You need to know how to put these on, but they're often not tolerated by most patients because they're squeezing the leg both day and night versus short stretch bandages which only work when the patient's calf muscle contracts and hits them. So when they're resting in bed at night, these are just sitting on their leg, but when they're walking, these are doing something by pushing that blood back. They work by resistance, so more tolerated. If you're unable to see the patient in a couple of days after applying an inelastic bandage, I would recommend one layer of tubi grip over the bandages and that'll give you some uh, extra help because if you put an inelastic bandage on a person with edema and then they start walking, they'll squeeze the edema out of their leg and therefore the inelastic bandage will fall down and you'll have to reapply it. So the tubi grip will give you a day or so extra. There are multi-layer compression systems. These are very well tolerated and more and more companies are producing multi-layer systems, which eventually become an inelastic system because they nearly all have some sort of a cohesive bandage on top. So once you put that cohesive bandage on sticking to itself, you now have an inelastic system like a plaster cast. And these, are again, then will help valvular function when the patient walks. The multi-layer bandages are more effective than one layer 
They have a high working pressure and a low resting pressure, so the elastic are not tolerated by patients, whereas the inelastic are. So helping to heal, the bandages are often um, used to heal due to the exudate and the dressings. But when the ulcer's healed, we would recommend staying in bandages for another month and then go into hosiery. If you go into hosiery too quick, because hosiery is elastic, then it will start to stretch over time and your new epithelium will crack and they'll start with another ulcer. So once you've got a venous leg ulcer healed, keep bandaging for another month. These are the classifications of the uh, pressures uh, in the guidelines. So the words are here and the pressures they deliver are here. And we ask ourselves, do they need open toe or closed toe, a knee high or thigh high? These are all personal preferences. There is no evidence you need to go above the knee. And personally, I find that the open toes ride up their foot during the day and you end up with a little bulge uh, between the, that end and the toes. So I like closed toe ones. The complaint is swelling because the fluid has been pushed to their knee and they say, cut off my circulation. But that is not true. You have to say to them, all this fluid around your knee would have been down there at the bottom, causing your ulcer to slow to heal unless we pushed it up. So if they get knee swelling, we either have to educate them about elevating more to drain it out during the day, or we actually go right up to a thigh high and push it even further. If they're not fitted correctly, you end up with damage. So you do need to make sure that when you're ordering hosiery that you order the right size, all but done by measurements. But if your patient looks like they're one who won't tolerate it, go one size up the first pair and then at least they'll wear them. The worst pair are the ones that stay in the box. Um, and then, then they all complain about their leg doesn't look like the one on the packet, you know, so clearly uh, there's problems there. These are some guy. these are a company chart telling you the different measurements and, and uh, sizings that you need according to that. So this company has a very broad range of products. That's a Sigvaris brand. And we also have fantastic colours out there now and styles. So become very modern and very funky. And I sell the Venison Athletics in my clinic and they come in pink, mauve, cobalt, blue, black and white and the patients love them. Getting them on, you might need some, oh, sorry, getting them on, you, some form of an aid. So there are many appliances out there and all the companies will tell you what they have available for you. All right, um, this is probably one of the easy ones. It's called Easy As, and if you've got a spouse to help your patient, this is quite good. But there are other forms. Non-compliance is often related to uh, the wearing of the garment, and that all comes down to our patient education, all right? Um, you want a pair of stockings or, or socks that are the length of the leg when you take them out of the box. So if you take a pair of stockings out of the box and they're this long and they're meant to fit a leg this long, when the person walks, they're going to slowly creep down and that's a complaint. So make sure that your sock that you're choosing or stocking you're choosing is the same length as the leg. All right, so there are different companies you have to look at. I personally do Venison or Sigvaris. They're very good companies. What's coming in to help patients manage themselves are self-adhesive wraps. So these Velcro-like garments with many, many tails and the patients can adjust them according to how much pain they have. There's a good side to that and then there's a bad side. I'll just put it on light. Well, that's not really very good. You need to keep squeezing. So you need the patients who are really keen to manage their disease in these. I encourage them to shower at night, dermise their leg at night, in the morning get up, put a light moisturiser on and then put their compression garment. If you put Derm Ease or any paraffin containing moisturiser on and then the socks straight on top, it eats the lycra in the socks and they won't last as long. And that is written on the instructions in the box. So I get them to change their habits and I say, look, you'll sleep better at night because you're like a baby now and everybody sleeps better after a bath. When you're just starting out, have one layer for the right size limb and then move up to the two to three 
And most of us won't put our elderly into anything above 20 millimetres of mercury pressure. 20 to 30 is roughly what we go into. They're easier for them to get on. If you go above the 30, they're actually quite hard to get on and even harder to get off. So you can just about fall head over heels trying to get them off. IPC is another fantastic device, intermittent pneumatic compression therapy. These are now available, rentable, $35 a week through a company called MediRent. And sometimes this is just what the patient needs. So I'm home watching Days of Our Lives. I put these two sleeves on my legs and I watch TV. Even if I don't elevate my legs, this thing squeezes the foot, then holds the foot, squeezes the ankle, holds the ankle, squeezes the calf, holds the calf, squeezes the knee, pushes it up. So you can get below knee or full leg height and it mimics walking. So very, very good for the patient who doesn't want to wear those medical grade stockings, etc. Very comfortable. So IPC, have a look at that. And they can put it on for, it does no harm. Also very good for patients who have mixed venous arterial disease. I've already mentioned that. Remember they've got to wash their uh, hosiery regularly. It restores the life of the garment. The hosiery should be reviewed every three months and probably do an ankle brachial pressure index every 12 months because eventually your venous patients, if they live long enough, may tip over into arterial. So that's our uh, run through wound management. It's very complex. We haven't covered the unusual ulcers, but don't fret about that because they are only a small percentage of the wounds we see in community. And most of them would be managed by a dermatologist. So if you can manage venous, manage the arterial that aren't being seen by the vascular surgeon and the mixed venous arterial, you're managing 80% of the patients with ulceration of lower legs. So thank you very much.